listening to Death Waves on WGMURadio.com. This is the first ever Zoom recorded interview that we are doing, so I'm actually really happy to be doing this. And with and my first guest for this Zoom interview is, believe it or not, the founding member of Motorhead, the one, the only, Mr. Lucas Fox. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great, mate. And it is, it is, this, is a, this is a real pleasure to be speaking to your listeners. I hope you're all safe there, yeah. out there, and, and please mask up and rock out in this rock down situation. Oh, it's, man. It's, 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 it's lovely to be talking to you and, and, and all of you gals and guys out there. I hope you're well and happy and, and having, a, having a good time because, uh, you know, I mean, let's face it. Okay, everyone's going, oh, this pandemic's awful. But I mean, in Europe, just, just an example, historic example. In 1945, at the end of the Second World War, there were 35 million displaced people in Europe. And, and we managed to get through that. Yes. Uh, we managed, you know, all the deaths and all the awful things in the Second World War. I mean, 2,000 years of warring around Europe. And, and we've managed to somehow come through it. We'll get through this as well. Um, but but we, 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 we have got to sort of, you know, shape up this, this mask thing. I don't know how much it's advertised in the States. I know one side seems to be a bit uh, in denial of all this. Oh, but, I know. Um, Trust me. But, I, live, but, I live. Yeah. But, but, but I'm, I mean, in, in the end, it's, it's a very straightforward thing. If you look at Japan and the Asian countries who wear masks a lot, lot without the pandemic, they have a much lower rate of transmission of, of flu and, and common cold. So, so, so it's really, you know, this, this thing is transmitted by spit, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, and, of and, course. And, and, you know, if, if you sneeze, did, I mean, I'll, I'll do a Michael Caine on you. Not a lot of people know this. But if, if, you, have, if you sneeze, that sneeze is going to go more than 10 metres. That's like 35 or 40 feet. Yes. And it's going to spread out just like, yes. a, like, just like buckshot. Yes. So, yes. so it's going to spread out. So, so yes. when you sneeze, it's going to hit like 10 people. Yes. And if, if you're in a crowd, it's probably going to hit 20 or 30 people. So, so that's why the mask is so simple. Gotcha. And, and anyway, I don't want to go on about that because we're not here to talk about health issues. But, but I care about people. And, 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 and the only way we're going to slow this damn thing down is by, by, a bit, be, be, is by being a bit care, careful about each other. You know? Of course. No, and, and that does make sense. And it's important to be mindful of the people around you during such a time because you never know where everyone's been at. You never know. Well, well yeah, and, 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 and even with the testing and stuff, you get tested and, and, and an hour later you bump into somebody bang you got it you know? yeah <laughs> so, exactly so so, so, so well uh, anyway let's let's get on with the interview it's oh, great to, it's great to be here it's a sunday afternoon in paris here where i've oh, been based for, for 32 years nice um i'm based here because the um the train network across europe is so good um i'm just down the road from a, a, a train station called gare du nord okay the, uh, the, the, the the northern train station in, in paris okay and uh, fr from there in two hours ten minutes i'm in central london and i'm only 20 minutes walk from the, the from the damn thing uh, also i can be in brussels in like an hour and a half i can be in amsterdam in two and a quarter hours i can wow. be south of france in france in marseille in three and a half hours i mean it's just high speed rail it's wonderful i don't really take planes very much um, no, of apart course. from obviously doing transatlantic, but but tr the trains are a wonderful form of transport. Because if you haven't missed your if you haven't missed your train, then you've got uninterrupted pleasure for for however long it is. You can go to the bar, you can work on your laptop, you can sleep, you can you know drink whatever it is you want to do. Yeah. Apart from smoke dope, you know. But I mean, <laughs> so, so, you know, is it how how is the how's the situation for that over there in France? Is it is it fully legalized or is it like? No, 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 no. It's 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 still completely hard assed here. Wow. I mean, where I where where I oh yeah 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 and and they've actually increased fines and 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 meant that um, basically uh, you get caught with a joint in France. It's just that you can be hit. Um, by a policeman, not hit literally, because they don't do that too much here. No. Um, but um, but but you you can be hit with a fine, automatic fine, um, of like 130 euros, which is like 130 dollars or something. Something. Oh, like that's that. that's that's way um, more. That's probably 140 dollars because of the tax because of the conversion rates. Yeah, yeah, and 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 but so, so you can be hit, hit. It's just like a parking ticket. So yeah. you haven't even got to go to court or any of that stuff. It's just like a parking ticket. Bang, you're you're done. You're busted. You know, wow. so, 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 so that's really not healthy. Um, in Britain, where I come from, um, all the police commissioners who are the equivalent of your police chiefs 
all of them right across the, the, the British Isles went to the government and said, look, we haven't got the manpower to handle this. And people who smoke dope are basically very friendly. They usually wanted to stay at home and watch DVDs and jerk off. And, um, and, 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 and they rarely drink because they're like quite, quite purist about it in general. Yeah. And they don't drink, drink and smoke. Um, they don't seem to drive too much. You know, so, so, so in which case it's not a problem. But if we have to bust them and put them in jail, then we are creating another problem because jail is one of the big universities in the world to teach you how not what to do you know of course. <laughs> so, so, of course. so i mean you know i've got nothing against people coming out of jail but, but it's, it's one of those problems that in jail you learn an awful lot of stuff that you only need to know if you want to keep down that path you know yeah, but yeah. anyway we're, we're here to talk about music <laughs> and, and, and little old me maybe uh, so, of course <laughs> that's why that's why that's why i asked you to appear on this <laughs> no but <laughs> no but uh it all it all seriousness though for those that are out of the loop Lucas, it, Mr. Fox right here, or Lucas, as he prefers to be called, he was, he was a founding member of Motorhead and, and played on several tracks that would go on to appear on the first Motorhead record. And he also played in the, Lon in the London punk rock band Warsaw Pact. Uh, like I said, so for Motorhead, I remember reading on, I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually go off the Wikipedia page for a second. I remember reading on the uh, Wikipedia page for you that you basically started Motorhead after picking up Lemmy from the London airport after he was sacked from Hawkwind in 1975. That's right. That's absolutely right. Um, How that? Like, was, so explain me all of that because that is my. When I read that, my like that blew my mind. Well, it, it, it's it, it depends where we where you want to set the, uh, the 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 start button for that story. Um, Just tell me everything. I would love to like. Like you want me to, you want to me, you want to be me to reveal all, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not all, but just, but just. What do you mean, not all? I'm, I'm sure they want all the gory details. Well, hey, and, and quite, and quite right too. <laughs> if, if you want, if you want all the gory details, you can lay them on me. Okay, uh, ha, just, just, just a question. I, I know that uh, America's quite a, um, a, a conservative country from some ways. Yeah. Um, how is your, how is your ra radio regarding swear words? Oh, hey, thank you for asking me that. I never actually managed to tell you. Keep it to a minimum. If not, don't swear. My radio station, unfortunately, is really strict on that. Fine. Okay. I just wanted to check that because cause, you. Cause, cause, no, cause, uh, I, I, I tend, to, uh, tend to swear a lot because that's part of my nature. Not because it's, um, um, it's blasphemous or, or because it's, it's just, I, I just think they're great words and they're very expressive. Yes, they are. <laughs> you know? But, but, but I just wanted to check that because cause I'm very sensitive to those sorts of things. And I don't want, you know, this radio program to be um, constantly going, blah, 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 beep, blah, 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 beep, <laughs> blah, 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 beep, which, which is a real pain. You know? Yeah, of course, of it's course. It's a pain, pain in the proverbial. Yes, it is. It, no, you're right. <laughs> not, not, not to name something which is an obvious part of our anatomy. No, of course. Something. So anyway, back to the question. <laughs> okay, so yes, um, Lemmy got kicked out of Hawkwind. Lemmy was in Hawkwind for four years. Yes, he was. And it was an accident that he got into Hawkwind in the first place. Lemmy was living with a mate of mine, a very close mate of mine afterwards, uh, Dick Mick. And Dick Mick, interesting enough, um, Dick, like your strange president Richard Nixon called Dicky, Tricky Dicky, right? Uh, it, Dick is a short, uh, short nickname for a person called Richard. So... Um, Dick Mick was called um, Richard. Uh, sorry, he was called. Yes, he was called um, uh, Richard Davies. Right. There was another Richard Davies in his class at school. So, to avoid confusion, they both became Dick Davies. Wow. And and my mate Dick Mick was Richard Michael Davies. And of course, the Mick Jagger. The, the, the shortened version of Michael is Mick. Yes. So of course, Dick Mick became Dick Mick. <laughs> <laughs> Duck Muck. So, yeah. so that's Dick Mick. Dick Mick and Lemmy were living in a squat in Labrack Grove, this wonderful place, which is a bit like Haight-Ashbury in, okay. in San Francisco. There were only two, really two places like this in the world, possibly Soho in New York as well. Okay. Um, but as far as rock and roll goes, this is where we all lived. We all lived in this strange community. Of, of kind of hippies and ne'er-do-wells and, and a wonderful, wonderful Jamaican community because nice. uh, it was a Jamaican front, uh, front line. And um, 
and uh, so uh, the, the the community was basically a whole mix. It was a very very poor housing situation. I mean, when I say poor, it was the same thing as Haight Ashbury. Haight Ashbury was all fallen down. Wow! And you and you could pick up apartments for absolutely nothing. And I'm talking about renting because nobody had enough money to buy. Same here. But I mean, we're talking about street after street after street of ran down buildings with peeling wallpaper and 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 um, and, uh, and 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 mold, you know, mold yeah. on the walls and stuff, and and, uh, and and overgrown and broken windows and and boarded up windows because nobody could afford to, to to replace the window. And it was just. <laughs> But it was wonderful. It's actually yeah. wonderful. And also um, pastel coloured houses. And these are these, originally they're beautiful houses, which have now been reverted to their original form by gutting them and redoing them. Oh. But therefore, Dick Mick and, and Lemmy were living in a squat in Labrador okay. Grove. Okay. And, uh, and one day, Dick Mick was in Hawkwind. Now, Dick Mick, very interesting character. Um, he bought himself a oscillator. And this is, I mean, you know, it's cast our minds back to the olden days in the 20th <laughs> oh, century. Yeah. Of course. And, uh, and, and there we are before synthesizers. Yes. And Dick Mick was the first person, as far as I know, in the world to start, start using these oscillators to get this space rock sound. And every, anybody who doesn't know Hawkwind, well worth discovering. Of An course. amazing band. Of course. Um, and, and, and Hawkwind, therefore. Haul the mountain grill, man. All, all of the mountain grill and of oh. course the mountain grill w was yeah. our local cafe oh wow so that's where it comes from okay i didn't know that yeah and it didn't have a hall it just had a door straight into the cafe <laughs> oh off, wow off. It, it, it was on portobello road which is our our, our local market not a uh, long 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 little road that goes all the way through that elaborate grove notting hill gate okay and I... so, so the mountain the mountain grill was in fact a, a greasy spoon <laughs> where you bought your fish and chips and your saveloys and and you know, and, and, and all the musicians used to meet there. Okay. So, 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 all of the mountain grill sounds incredibly. You immediately have it in, in your mind. You think of these these eerie castles in a strange space sci-fi land. Yeah. Of course, it's it's a greasy chip shop. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, anyway, man. so so so, so um, Dick Mitzing Hawk, Hawkwind has been there for a while, and he's a speed freak, and uh, so is Lemmy. Yeah, of course. And uh, and they're they're both living together quite happily, dealing a bit of speed and, and taking speed. And, and Lemmy's a rhythm guitarist. Yes, he's not a bass player. And uh, he was a rhythm guitarist in the Rocking Vickers. You know, yes, he was. Sam Sam Gapal, etc. Yep. All these other bands. And he was also one of Hendrix's roadies. In yes, Stanley, he was. Which you probably yes, read about. Yes. Um, and not a lot of people know this again. Michael Caine. Um, <laughs> not a lot, but he used. To, Hendrix used to have him go and go and get his deals of, of, of acid. Wow, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Lemmy was was Hen was Hendrix's acid dealer, and uh, and Hend <laughs> you know, he'd, he'd, he'd go and pick up his acid for him, and uh, and therefore what would happen was was uh, Hendrix would say, "Hey, Lemmy, you want to go and pick up some acid for me?" Because he's a real sweet guy, Hendrix. Sure. And uh, and Lemmy go, "Yeah, all right. How much do you want?" He goes. Uh, picking me up about eight or ten tabs, and he'd come back with eight or ten wow. tabs, and 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 uh, Hendrix would would swallow seven of them and insist that Lemmy took the other three immediately. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we're talking, we're talking about serious, mind blowing experience. Are you experienced? Damn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know that. So, joke. Yeah. So, 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 so Lemmy had, had, wow. had been. Uh, been, been, you know, seriously out of his box quite a lot. Anyway, so, so there you have Dick Mick and Lemmy uh, in this elaborate Grove squat, and Dick Mick's off going, going, do the, doing these these gigs everywhere with Hawkwind. Yeah, and at one point, Dick Mick comes back and he says, uh, "Here, Lemmy, uh, you need to, you know, come come along on the bus. Uh, we're missing a musician. Come along on the bus." So Lemmy gets on the bus to go to this first gig with Hawkwind, and on the bus um, they turn around and say, um, "Well." You're going to be playing bass. Silence. Lemmy goes. Well, I've only, I've only got me rhythm guitar, yeah. And uh, and Del Detmar, who's one of the band, who's driving the bus, turns around and says, "No, no problem, Lemmy. I've got a bass in the back. It's off now, whatever, you know. There's 35 quid bass." <laughs> and <laughs> that, that's that's how Lemmy started playing bass. Now, what's interesting about this this long rambling story is that Lemmy's bass style 
starts from this rhythm guitar attitude, yes, playing chords, yep, and then picking the chords, yep, and then we flash across. If you will be so patient, dear listeners, dear friends, gals and guys, and we go across to Boris the Spider. Boris the Spider. spider. Okay, with yeah. the bass sound on that. Dum, doodle, dum, doodle, dum, doodle, dum, dum. And you're talking about fucking lead, oh, excuse me, beep, a lead <laughs> bass, a lead bass, okay? Therefore, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a lead guitar, lead bass style mixed with a rhythm guitar. And that's, that becomes Lemmy's style. That becomes Lemmy's hallmark, okay? Yeah. Um, therefore, Lemmy starts playing bass but yeah. in, a, in a strange and different way that most people don't do. Yes. Uh, apart, apart from the ox, Entwistle, who's called, also called the ox, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, John Entwistle, very tall man, um, brilliant. Um, a complete clothes fanatic, gotcha. again. A clothes fanatic. He, he spent all his money on buying clothes. It's very strange. Wow. Anyway, so, so uh, and of course, you know, there, there we have it. Now, Lemmy and I have been hanging out together for a long time before he got kicked out of Hawkwind. And um, because I met Lemmy at the Speakeasy. Now, yeah. the Speakeasy, the famous, world famous Speakeasy, um, was the club where all musicians went to. Gotcha. And, and uh, at the age of the, the tender age, I, I started drumming at the age of nine, right? N nice. Uh, uh, and at nine years old, in one of the worst winters that Britain has ever known, um, in the snow, um, I go door to door in my. We're out in the suburbs in, in, um, in Chiswick, uh, which is near Hammersmith Odeon, in fact, funny enough. Oh, nice. And, um, and um, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, so, so, so uh, I've been plaguing my parents for a drum kit for like months with little signs hanging up all over the house saying, <laughs> I must have a drum kit. You remember, I need a drum kit. My birthday's coming soon. I need a drum kit. I must have a drum kit. And it, I'm playing it and pissing, pissing my parents and everybody off, you know. And we haven't got much money at the time. So they advanced my birthday from the Monday, 25th of February, to the Saturday so that I can enjoy what I'm getting as a, as a present. Yeah. And I really excited on that Saturday morning. I must have got up really early for the first time in my life, apart right. from staying up all night. I'm, not a, I'm, I'm a night bird. Yeah. I like to be up at night. Yeah, and um, and so I, I, I raced down the staircase in our, in our little house in Chiswick and, uh, and go into the dining room. And there on the dining room table is one box. I look at it and go, and I'm looking around the dining room, where's the rest of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, and so I open, you know, wrapping paper all over the table and stuff, you know, in a frenzy of a nine-year-old frenzy. Yeah. And I open it up and it's a lovely snare drum with a little stand and one tiny little splash cymbal. Splash cymbals are called splash because they go, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great, great sound. Great. Yeah. I, I've got some uh, uh, over there. I don't know, can you, can, where are you? Uh, where uh, are you? There's, there's my drum kit over here. Gotcha. Okay, I've, got, I've got this lovely Gretsch drum kit. Okay. How are you going to see this? If I... I need to see this. You need to see this. Hang on. Let's okay. put some light on the subject. No worries. And therefore, now we're looking at me. Now you're looking at, there's the drum kit. See, that, that looks very nice. All okay. the symbols look really nice on it. They're, they're Zildjans. They're beautiful. And this is... There that's you go. a splash symbol. They're gotcha. all Zildjans, you see. Gotcha. It's a lovely, great, lovely, lovely Gretsch kit. Very gotcha. small kit, but, uh, but it's, it's great because this house is actually soundproofed. Nice. So, um, which is great, both for, both for drumming and, and for girlfriends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. That, that, that's not too racy for you, is it? No, it's not. No, goodness. <laughs> okay, well, because this is going to get a bit racy in, in various areas. So anyway, there we are. Me, in my dining room, open up the snare drum. I set up the snare drum with this tiny little stand and a little stand for, for the cymbal. And, uh, and I set it up. And, I, and so I race up back up the stairs and my father and mother are still in bed. And I go up to my father and say, thanks so much. This is real sweet. Um, where's the rest of it? <laughs> <laughs> my father, who's, who's kind of very dry, got these cold steel blue eyes and a rather frightening person. Yeah, he, 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 he wears a monocle and he just lets the monocle drop and he, his paper goes down, his monocle drops out of his eye and goes, if you're serious about it, you'll find a way. And pops his monocle back in. And, oh. and 
so they are they are just like so pissed off with me that, that you know for months i've been plaguing them we haven't got much money and that's all they could afford so yeah. a snare drum is a good start yeah so anyway so so you if you you know if you're serious about this you'll find a way so quick as a flash into the old brain i raced back down the stairs into the kitchen opened the cupboard doors under the sink the sink you know the yeah where the water is yep and uh, and grab what we, well, we don't have rubber in those days or plastic. So, uh, I mean, we have rubber, but not, it's not a rubber bucket. So it's no. a metal bucket. Yeah. So I grab a big, big, big iron bucket and, and, and sponges haven't arrived in Europe then either. Wow. So, so it's like, it's like a rag, you know, like, like a dish, dishcloth yeah. and, some, and some soap. And off I go, put, put on some Wellington boots, which are these big rubber boots nice. um, over, over my pajamas and a pair of jeans over my pajamas and a woolly, uh, a woolly jumper and a woolly hat and yeah. nice warm coat and some gloves nice. and off I go into the snow but 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 can I wash your car please at the age of nine right and okay. they're all sort of looking looking around going but it's snowing <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't matter I've got to earn some money I've got to buy a drum kit you know yeah. and, and, and so half of them like took you know they, they gave me a, a couple of pennies yeah um, and they said I'll oh, go and get out of here um, you know come, come back when there's no snow you'll be able to wash the car then of course. So after about three or four cars and three or four neighbors, um, I have enough money to buy my first pair of drumsticks. Nice. So I go back into the house completely drenched and, and with the one car I did wash, I, it's like cold water running down into my armpit. I will never forget that feeling. Horrible. Oh, because car, car, cars were high in those days. Yeah. And plus you had the snow and, and I was very small. Yes. So, you know, a nine year old. And, and so anyway, cut a long story slightly shorter. Um, race back into the house, um, you know, by then it's like 10 o'clock in the morning. And I say, mum, we've got to go to King Street Music Stores. This is where all the drummers go to buy their, their kit. And uh, so off we go. And the last client I've got uh, says, here, son, when you buy your first pair of drumsticks, you make, make sure you roll them up and down the counter to see if they're straight or not. I go, okay, got it. I don't know why, but I'm going to do this, right? So, so I've, got, I've, I've got the plan. Yeah. And I've got these li little piles of pennies in my hands, right? Yeah. And so off we go to King Street Music Stores, and uh, we open the door, and it goes, cling, 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 one of the little bells, you know, little bells, so the door, door's opening. Of course. Cling, 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 and we walk in. And uh, to my right, there's a guy with long hair, long dark hair and a big nose. Of course. And on my left, not, not as long as yours, a bit shorter, but in those days it was long, uh, because it was pre-hippie, remember? Course. We're, 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 you know, we're, I'm nine, so, so, so it's like 62, 63. Okay, so it's before like Woodstock and all that stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, way okay. before that. Okay, oh, way, okay. Way, way before. You okay. know, I mean, so, so anyways, there's the guy with, a little guy, a bit taller than my, myself, uh, on my right, and then on my left is a slightly bigger guy with long dark hair and, uh, and a big nose as well. And behind him seems to be a really, to me as a youngster, a really old guy, right? And anyway, so I'm rolling my sticks up and down the counter. I've got my little uh, little piles of pennies yep. all lined up perfectly to yep. exactly the right amount of money and not one penny less Correct. and not one penny more <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> to, to buy my first pair of drumsticks. Okay. And these, these, these three geezers standing around me are sort of looking, looking at me sort of with a little smile on their face. They're looking at each other going, Oh yeah, here, here goes another one. <laughs> here, 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 here's another one on the sunken trail to misery. Oh and, no. Uh, no, no, in joke. Oh, okay. sense of, British, British sense of humour, come on. Gotcha, and, gotcha. Uh, and, uh, and so um, anyway, um, then uh, Mick and Keith turn up and take away the old geezer at the back. It's Charlie Watts. Okay. The, the drummer of Rolling Stones. And, uh, and then no Paul, McCartney and jo Paul, uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon turn up and take away Ringo standing on my left. Whoa! And then Pete Townsend and the Ox, the bass player, turn up and take away Keith Moon, who's standing on my right. So there I am at the age of just 10. In fact, I'm actually nine, because it's a Saturday. I'm not even 10. And I'm standing in a room full of three of the most iconic drummers wow. of, the fu of the future. But at that point, they're still playing very small gigs. Wow. Charlie Watts has just joined the band. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, we're, we're at a, 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 a real cusp point. Wow. So kind of, that kind of sealed my fate. Oh, that, that's nothing. <laughs> that's nothing. 
but anyway, so, so, so there we are, and we'll get back to Lemmy in a second. And so, so, um, so off I go, and for about two or three years, I spend a lot of time washing cars, and finally managed to get, to get, get together this, uh, this higgledy-piggledy misshapen kit of different makes and different colours and all the rest of it. But I'm, I'm starting to drum. At the age of 13, I'm in blues bands. Uh, I'm still at the French, French school, the Lycée in London, oh. which was much less posh than it is now. Okay. And although we didn't have much money, they managed to scrabble enough money to pay for this, um, which wasn't that expensive relatively in those days. Okay. And um, they wanted to have uh, little European kids um, that spoke another language, which I thought was a totally good idea. Yeah. And, and didn't have a uniform either, so, so it was well cool. Right. Anyway, so, um, so, so there we are, your, your friend of mine, Lucas, who's, who's now drumming away. Um, and by about the age of 17, I finally finished, I managed to get out of the lycée, having done all my exams earlier, one year earlier, because I can't stand being there anymore. Gotcha. And I just, I just want to get out there because uh, I really want to drum. And, um, and therefore I start answering ads in the back of the Melody Maker, which is our equivalent of not Billboard, but one of those, you know, it's like a music mag. Gotcha. And, and at the back, there's, there's all these, uh, you know, um, looking for a drum at no bread heads, no time wasters type ads. <laughs> and um, and so, so I'm replying to these and starting to go, go to auditions and I'm getting all the ones I don't want and I can't get the ones I do want. So I start realizing, ah, I'm going to have to break this circle. Gotcha. So I, I, for, for about three months, I replied to every single ad that was in the Melody Maker. Gotcha. And went religiously to all these, these auditions. And finally, I became hardened enough Gotcha. I didn't give a flying proverbial um, to uh, as to what uh, you know. Take me on, to, take me or leave me. This is what you got. Yeah. And I started. So I started getting, getting the the drumming gigs I wanted. Yeah. So there I'm. There I am. Just turned eighteen, and uh, in fact seventeen. And I go to the Speakeasy, this famous club, because I know that I, to, in order to get into this world, you know, a lot of people, you know, ask this question: How how did you get into Motorhead? You're, you're pretty much an unknown drummer with yeah. a lot of experience. Yeah. Um, how did you get into Motorhead? And this is, this is the, basically, I went into the speakeasy, lied about my age, because I never had a baby, baby face. So, so, so at the age of 12, I was already looking like an adult. Nice. Um, and used to go to the marquee and stuff. Okay. And see, um, oh, I saw everybody at the marquee. I saw John Mayles Blues Breakers with Eric Clapton and also with Jeff Beck and also with... Um, uh, the guy who joined the Stones replacing Brian Jones, whose name escapes me right, just right now. Wow. Uh, Mick, Mick, Mick Taylor. Um, I saw um, all, all the bands, the Yardbirds there. Oh, wow. With Keith, with Keith Relf and, 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 and Jimmy Page. That's uh, a I saw, uh, late, Later on, I saw Led Zeppelin there in front of 300 people. Wow. And Led when, Zeppelin were just coming about. Okay, so um, when they were like a club band before they blew up in popularity and whatnot? You got, yeah. Mm. Wow. Wow, man. That's such a trip to see bands like on the come up up like that, like just before yeah. they become like because because I'm t I'm 23, so I look at not to be that guy, but I look at everything with the historical perspective. So when I hear stuff like this, it always blows my mind. It always, but of course, you know, and every band, almost every band, started off small. Yes, of course. This this is the thing one forgets, you know. Yeah. And this is this is the sort of down to earth Lucas approach to things. Is, is that uh, well, you meet you meet the same people on the way up as on the way down. Yeah. So you might you might as well be respectful and nice. Yeah, of course. Because you, you that's just talking selfishly. Yeah. Apart from you, you need to be respectful and nice anyway. Yeah. Because that that's the way I believe in living, you know. But but um, as a gentleman. So anyway, so 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 I lied about my age, got my membership card for the speakeasy, and still having not much money, uh, in fact almost no money. Um, therefore, I'm I'm going to the speakeasy two or three nights a week, and drinking one half of beer and making that last all night. Nice. <laughs> Until, um, yeah, well, nice, yes. <laughs> and, but I'm starting to learn the lingo, you know, because suddenly in the 60s, in, in the 60s, um, everything has changed. The, um, the language has changed. The way of living has changed. Um, the way everyone's dressing completely different from each other. Um, the speakeasy, you know, you've got Keith Moon standing on, standing on a table with a bottle of, bottle of cognac in his hand. You've got Oliver Reed, the actor, standing next to him. In the corner, you've got maybe status quo. In another corner, you've got Thin Lizzy. 
uh, my surra God. Surra surrounded by girls. Um, you've got all sorts of people coming in and out, Robert Plant, etc. Et this is a speakeasy of, 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 of the late 60s, early 70s. Wow. So this is the place you need to be if you can get in there. And I was lucky enough to, to bluff my way in there. And so this was, if you like, the, 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 the turning point, which meant that I could actually get into this world um, from my strange education in a French lycée, which had nothing to do with the music business. And, and also meant I was a bit of an odd one out because I was completely bilingual and bicultural. And the buy-in's there for the moment, but I'll yeah. never say never. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, I don't know about, of course, I could be bisexual as well, but I'm not. But, and I've got nothing against anybody no, who's LGBTQ, et cetera, no. all for it, you know. Yeah. Um, everybody needs to be able to do what they want to do. You know, of that's course. As far as I'm going. It's your own life, live it yep. to the full. This is not a rehearsal. We're only here once. Yes, exactly. Until, until you know, proven wrong and coming back as a, I don't know, as a frog or yeah, if or, you or, believe or, it, if, or, if or the locust or something. Yeah, if reincarnation is your thing. But Ooh. yeah, so so you met so so did you meet Lemmy at the Speakeasy or? I met Lemmy at the Speakeasy, okay. uh, like four or five years later. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I, and I was already gigging a lot, and at the age of twenty, I was in a strange little band called W. H. Pierce Band. Okay. W.H. Pierce Band was basically an R&B, rhythm and blues. Um, that's not R&B, like rap R&B. This is rhythm and blues like it was then, right? Okay. So it's, so it's rhythm and blues. It's blues plus rhythm. So it becomes Yardbirds, Early okay. Led Zeppelin. All of okay. those bands were rhythm and blues bands. Okay. And, um, and so I've lost my thread just a second. Uh, so yeah, met, met let me there. But, but at the age of 20, I was already in a band, W.H. Pierce band. And we were looked after, we were under the wing of Pink Floyd. Wow. And, and, and they were lending us their, um, their prototype. Very interesting for, for those who are into this sort of stuff. For you geeks of, of equipment out there, these are the first Martin bass bins. Wow. Mar, Mar, Dave Martin became the worldwide um, some of the best PAs and you know, sound systems in the world. Gotcha. And, and, and Pink Floyd had their prototypes, and then they started building these amazing um, PA systems. Gotcha. Um, because up until then, it, it was like what they're called WEM, and you had like a four by 10 inch speaker column, and you had hundreds of them to try right. and make up enough sound to, to combat the sound of the, the crowd and the, the, the volume, because the Beatles couldn't hear, hear themselves on stage. And the crowd couldn't really hear them either. I saw the Beatles loads of times when I was like 12, 13 at gotcha. Hammersmith Odeon, amongst sure. others. Nice. I saw, the I saw the Stones there loads of times. I saw Ike and Tina Turner there. I saw Ray Charles there, Stevie Wonder there. Wow. Uh, who else did I see at Hammersmith Odeon? Uh, Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis. Oh, my God. All, 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 the, all the blues stuff, um, you know, um, uh, including all the Fats Dominoes and people like that. Oh, it's great. Anybody who came to, to Britain usually passed through Hammersmith Odeon and, and nine times out of ten we went. Okay. At, at a very early, yeah, 12, 13, 14 yeah. years old. So, um, so back to WH Pierce Band with these bass bins and, and these, these PA stacks. We also had Alan and Heath um, mini console, like a 24-channel console. is one of the first miniaturized consoles. Great. Sure. And so, so we were kind of looked after by Pink Floyd's stuff and we ended up being produced by roger waters and nick mason wow so we spent we spent a week at nick mason's house in okay. islington north london okay um being produced by roger waters and nick mason it was the week that dark side of the moon went to the to, to the top 10 in america wow so um they were suddenly overnight millionaires you know yeah which band were you in at the time that they were recording what was the band name W. H. Pierce Band. Gotcha. But I don't believe okay. I don't believe any any recordings exist. Now, funnily enough, there was a bass player called Dave Ambrose. Dave Ambrose is also a close mate of mine, even now. Nice. Hmm. Oh yeah, I'm in touch with a lot of people that I played with 40 years ago, and um, and Dave Ambrose was a bass player in Brian August Trinity. For anybody who is fans of a wonderful series called Absolutely Fabulous. Okay, absolutely fabulous. Has a, has a generic song, wheels on fire, rolling down the road. De, 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 this wheel shall explode. That's Brian Aldergus Trinity. So he's in that okay. band. It's a big band at the time, worldwide hit. 
And he was also in Crazy World of Arthur Brown. Gotcha. Where his audition to get into Crazy World of Arthur Brown um, was Arthur Brown put him in, a, in another room, gave him a tab of acid and waited 45 minutes for the acid to come in, kick in. Yeah. And then said, all right, come in and play. If you get yeah. through this, you'll be in our bass player. Wow. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's crazy times, you know. This, this is the sort of thing that went on. Cause, that cause is, as far as that, that's... a bit like Hawkwind took a lot of acid. Oh, say. of course. Well, I mean, I know like when they were writing music, like they were taking acid left and right. And well, Lemmy was a speed freak. He wasn't that much of an acid guy. That's exactly right. That, yeah. Hence, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, 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 yeah. The first time I, I met Lemmy um, was at the Speakeasy. Yeah. And um, and therefore I, I got quite a lot of experience and was gigging quite a lot and, and doing a lot of studio sessions. Yeah. And he was obviously in Hawkwind and, and recording. I think I think the Hall of the Mountain Grill was what they recorded in seventy four. Yeah. In seventy seventy four, I met Lemmy. Yes. And um, and so we were hanging out together, probably also because I had a car. And I was useful. He didn't drive. Oh, Therefore, yeah. it's much, much cheaper for him to have, a, have his own personal taxi driver. Of course. And um, so I was kind of 22 years old and he was 27, 28 or something. Of course. At the time, um, what were we in 74? He was born in 45 or 44, 45, wasn't he? 45. It was, so, it, it was. So, 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 so he, he was like uh, 29 or something, I suppose, at the time, seven years older than me. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's about right. I was born in 53, so something like that. And um, you can see my mass is really hot, isn't it? <laughs> um, so, 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 so but, but we had the same obsessions. Um, we had the same musical taste. Um, and I can remember the first conversations we had. I mean, for a start, he had this wonderful sense of humour. Yes. Um, I don't know if I can tell this joke over here. It's a bit rude. No, I won't. So, so, so we won't take the risk. Um, okay. Anyway, so, so, so we had the same sort of stupid Monty Python style humour. Oh, you know, nice. This, this okay. Like okay. Fifth, n none of it's n none of it's Mr. Bean. I love Mr. Bean, but I yeah. prefer Blackadder. Yeah. Um, it's it's all sort of like fifth degree and stuff humour, like really wacky and out the yeah, yeah, of course, off it's, off the wall. It's very outlandish, uh, outlandish left field type humour. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and uh, and uh, so so we had the same sense of humour. Um, musical taste. So um, the first night we spent together, the first time we met, we spent spent the night up all night on speed, and went oh. back to his went back to his place. Uh, I think it was the first night, might have been the second night. Um, I think it was the second. It was the second night. It, 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 it was the night after. It gets the, a little the, hazy. The, uh, I, I, strangely enough, maybe I've got Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's old timers disease. <laughs> but I've got an incredibly clear imagery and memory of, of most of it. Okay. Obviously, there's massive patches that I can't remember at all. <laughs> I mean, how much can you remember of what you, you're like 23? Yeah. How much can you remember of what you were when you were 11? Yeah, of course. So it's, it's a sim, even, even a normal person is going to forget yeah. all sorts of blocks of memory. And memory is very, very selective as well, of course. Yes, it is. It is. So, um, so anyway, so... Um, I've got a very, very clear memory, and I'm, I'm writing my book at the moment, which is great fun, because it's the first time I, I'm actually plunging into my past, because I've always spent my life living going forward. Yes. I've, ne I've never actually thought about what happened behind, you know. Yes. So, so, um, so, so there we are uh, at the speakeasy, at the bar of speakeasy, and, um, and uh, we get to know each other really well, really fast, and we got the same. He also rode horses. I ride horses. Um, his father was a vicar vicar you know of the church oh okay 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 uh my grandfather was a vicar so we both had to put up with these sermons all the time okay you know, even even when, even when, when it wasn't in church we were being sermoned okay. you know oh okay. you know you shouldn't do this and you should do that all that okay. stuff which okay. we hated yeah and so so we had that in common we had the second world war which i i studied um not in school but just like passionate very yeah. passionate i mean I was, I was only born eight years after the Second World War finished. Okay. Therefore, um, everywhere in London where I was brought up, in the centre of London before we moved to Chiswick, uh, and even in Chiswick, every single street had, had, a, had, had a bomb crater in it. Wow. Well, the Blitz, you know, we forget yeah, of course. The, Blitz, the Blitz, the Blitz okay. in 1940. Yeah. Um, people were dying a thousand a night. Wow. And we had virtually uninterrupted for 60 days. Oh yeah, that's of right. Blitz, of the Blitz, that's you know. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, that's so, right. so, so, uh, you know, a lot of people forget this, yeah. but this, this is also explains something about British bands. But I'll go back to that in a minute, if you will. 
So, so there we are, Lemmy and I, obsessed by the Second World War and history in general, but mainly the Second World War. And also, we also have this thing where, um, how can you put this? There was so much hero worship. And this is, you know, psychologically a, a whole country which has stood alone. Right. Britain yeah. had stood alone against Nazi Germany and the whole of Europe had been invaded. Yes. And my mother was involved in, 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 in the, uh, in, in the, um, in the uh, Air Force. Yes. Um, and was on the base that sent all the, um, all the uh, resistance members to Europe. Gotcha. She was a com commandant of that base okay. at a very young age. Okay. And it was the most secret base in Britain. Gotcha. And, um, and so, so, so even she said, look, uh, you know, in 1940, we were convinced we were going to lose. However much Churchill was going, oh, well, no, we'll, we'll fight them on the beaches and all this. Quite right. Yes. But, but in your heart of hearts, you're going, well, our armies spread all over the world in these strange colonies that we still can't afford to have. Yes. And, and there's almost nobody at home. We've got the Navy, which is the most powerful Navy in the world. But again, that's stretched out all over yeah. the world to defend yeah. the colonies. Yes. And, and there's Hitler who's just on speed. Yes. Pervertine. Pervertine, the whole of, of Germany, Nazi Germany, was on Pervertine. And it started with, with, with uh, the, um, the Spanish Civil War, where they yes. tested Pervertine on the pilots yeah. and on the tank commanders to make right. them be able to stay up all night and, and just keep, keep fighting. Yes. So, so how they invaded uh, Europe was also due to a drug called Pervertine, which is gotcha. speed. Gotcha. Um, so... Um, both Lemmy and I are fascinated by this, and, and we've also been sermonized, sermonized too, by our, his father, my grandfather, and also everybody around. It's just such a sense of relief that we hadn't lost. Yeah. Uh, you know, this hero thing becomes, you know, way over the top. And of course, you know, America came into the war, thank God. Thank you for coming into the war. Of course. I've got to, I've got to admit it was a little late, <laughs> like in the First World War, where yep. America came in in 1917. Yep. Uh, American you know, isolationism. Before, yeah. I'm afraid. And, yeah. and, 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 and even then, you know, I mean, they only really came in because, uh, because of Pearl Harbor, you know? Yeah, yes. Um, even though um, Churchill's mother was American, yes. which also helped, you know, yeah. helped that, that uh, Roosevelt and Churchill got on well. Yes. But, um, but therefore, therefore, you know, you've got this situation, which, which is kind of a strange situation, where everywhere on all the TV channels, etc., it's, you know, how glorious we were, how wonderful we were, you know, and it just went on and on and on, year in, year out. Oh, here we go, another commemoration. It was just endless. Yes. It was just endless. And, and most of us kids and stuff who were very passionate about it in any way, and we knew a lot about it because we'd been so, so much... Um, so much had been thrown at us, yeah. You know, and the Nuremberg Tars and the terrible death camps, and you know, they're all, yeah. you know, the, the serious, nasty stuff that went on. Yes, of and um, but but there was also a kind of rejection, um, a kind of rejection of um, this constant hero worship thing. Yes, uh, and and we started looking separately. Lemmy and I were both separately when I was a kid, and when he was a lot younger. He started looking at the opposition. Now, image, the image-wise, and this is where I'm coming around to this. Image-wise, um, I was fascinated. Uh, I used to do you make model kits when you were a kid. I, I I came across them, but I was always afraid of building them because I was like, I don't want to destroy anything. So I never actually built them. I would always look at them like this is cool, but I would never actually build them because I was like, I I don't want to mess anything up. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what, you can't make omelets without breaking eggs. <laughs> that's true. No, you're right. And, you're right. And, 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 and in messing things up, that's how you get the great idea. That's true. No, you're right. You're right. You've got, you, you got to make mistakes in life to, to advance. No, and, you're and right. And out, 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 out of those mistakes, you know, we'll come to the musical side of, of that particular argument as well, because it's, oh, yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah. That, 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 that it's, it's not just copying the others that, 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 that gets you to be an individual. No. It's all the mistakes you make which become your way of doing things. Like Lemmy. Yes. Rhythm, rhythm guitarist Guitar. who turns bass player. Bases. And it turns but, out to be one of the best bass players of all time. Uh -huh. well, I, word, I think but, so. I think yeah. so. Honestly, I'd be, I'll be very honest with you. Let me to like, like I play, I'm a bass player myself. I can never play with the, oh, pick cool. to, I can never play with the pick to save my life. 
But in terms of bass tone, I think Lemmy has the greatest bass tone of all time. I don't care about anyone else's bass tone. I want Lemmy's bass tone. That Rickenbacker, Murder One, Marshall, Amp tone, I want that tone. Every time I get a pedal, I'm always like, how can I make this help my bass sound like Lemmy? You, you, got, a, you got a Rickenbacker? I'm try. Don't have a Rickenbacker. Four hundred one. Yeah, they're expensive. I need one. No, I need yeah. a. Ri I need one. I like if I could get that, then it's done. I I, I can I can get the Lemmy tone like that. Uh, well, well, then then you probably need to ch change the pickups on it because because yeah. because Lemmy. Uh, he was a humbucker uh, guy. He was a humbucker guy, absolutely, and yeah. and those humbuckers are great pickups. Oh yeah, so, they so, are. So, so and 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 also the the amps and and, and uh, Jim Marshall, who built the Marshall amps, yep, um, was was also a very in, like Dave Martin, was at the front line, and 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 Pete Townsend, who played High Watt, and uh, and all the bands at the time used to go and see Jim Marshall, and Jim Marshall would say, "Well, what do you really need out of these amps, you know?" And and he'd build new amps all the time, um, yeah. and it's constantly, constantly improving them. Yeah. And, and you know, Lemmy's bass sound also comes from from the technology yes, that, it does. That, that, that was built into the the, the amps and uh, and what speakers and all you know. Yes, of course. So so that's the geek side of it. But but um, so 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 there we are. You know, and I'm building these kits, and the Spitfires are all. all Spitfire was a, 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 a British plane, a very very good British plane, but also a terrible killing machine. Of course, it's a fighter. Wow, it's a fighter aircraft, and. Um, but it looks, it's all in curves. It's a beautiful looking, if, if you Google up a Spitfire, it's a beautiful looking air, aircraft. Gotcha. And, uh, and it looks really sweet. And it's Mer it has Rolls Royce Merlin engines, which got wow. sound, sounds amazing. Um, and, and the camouflage was, was like green blobs and, and brown blobs, which imitated the countryside um, around the south of England at the time, you see. Gotcha. So it looked really safe and sweet and friendly. Gotcha. for a killing machine. Gotcha. On the other side, opposite the Spitfire, was the Messerschmitt 109, which is the German na Nazi aircraft, yeah. which looked really mean. And, yeah. and its, it, its wings were cut off square, yes. like, like chisel, chisel toe, toe um, cowboy boots, you know? Yeah. They were yeah. cut off square. The nose was cut off square, and in the nose was a cannon. Yes. Um, the camouflage, instead of being lovely sort of brown and green blobs, was like all this, this strange, it looks like, looks like a python or something. Gotcha. Not Monty Python, but like a python, the snake. Yes. And um, it's, it's not a flying circus. And, uh, <laughs> any, uh, and, and anyway, and, and of course, the, 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 um, the, uh, all, all the imagery, um, the, the black crosses, the swastikas. Yeah. Now, the Iron please, Cross. please, I, I will underline in red, and I'll do it several times. Lemmy and I were not Nazis no, and have nothing to do with anything to do with Nazism or the doctrine or anything that, which I think is horrendous. Yes. Um, and, 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 and really needs to, you know, it needs to be looked at carefully because it's, it's, it's a very, very nasty way yeah. of thinking about human beings and life. Yes. It's not, it's not what I can prone at all. No. But, but we were anti-establishment. Yes. Hawkwind and Pink Fairies were two of the most anti-establishment bands around. Yes. At the time, at the time, um, no, I'll, I'll, let's just finish off on, on, the, on, on, the, on the imagery. Sure. Because there, on one side, I, I, and I'm buying all the books and, and really getting into it, and the SS divisions and, you know, the, the SS uniforms were designed by Hugo Boss, yep. the famous designer. Um, the Tiger Tank and the Panther Tank, which are two of the most, most dangerous and, and beautifully built um, uh, German Nazi tanks um, were both built by um, Ferdinand Porsche, who did Porsche sports cars. Yes. Uh, yeah, right? Wow. And, and the imagery, um, all of that imagery is something that we both kind of went, this is looking really dangerous. I like the look of this. As opposed to um, the khaki uniforms of the Americans, the khaki uniforms of the British. It yeah. all looks like really safe and, 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 and nice. And, you know, it, it all looks like, you know, the round helmets. Look at the German helmet. It's like all cut off square like that. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, the year after Motorhead, George Lucas got his designer to imitate the German helmet to do the Darth Vader helmet. Wow. Darth, Darth Vader's head is a German helmet. Wow. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you look at it and you just compare that to a, to a First World War, Second World War German helmet, I will. You've got it. There it I, is. There I it will. Is. It's just painted black like the SS, 
and he's all in black like the SS. Gosh. So, so that, that is the epitome of evil. Yes. And this is, this is, again, this evil thing. It's a question of we were anti-establishment. The establishment had been so pompous about us winning, which I know was relief and all that. I fully understand it. And God knows, um, with my mother being in it, with my father being in India and stuff, um, during the war and stuff, God knows I was so for it. And as I say, every single street all over Britain had bomb craters. And as I started coming to France, you know, these towns got completely destroyed by the war. I mean, it was just a horrendous, horrendous situation. Sorry. And of course, the, the sheer cruelty of, of the Nazi troops was just horrendous. So, so anyway, so, so there you have a kind of beginning of what becomes the motorhead image. Yes. Which is this, both of us were obsessed with the Second World War and the imagery yes. of, of, of the other side, yes. because they were the other side. Yes. And because this would shock our parents, this would shock everyone. the establishment, everyone. Yeah. The idea was to shock. Yes. The use of skulls, um, the skulls, which I've got one somewhere here. There's a Tottenkopf, which is that, yes. which is on, on the lapels here. Yes. Um, the, the Iron Cross, all of those things were, were images which were so horrendous to Europe yes. and the world yes. that they flashed up the worst memories. Yes. And th this was a deliberate um, antagonistic approach, which was then, of course, picked up by um, Vivian West, Vivian West, well, Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren oh. picked up on all, on, on all the Motorhead imagery okay. as anti-establishment. And that's only six months after Motorhead began. Wow, okay. Motorhead began in 75. Yes. Beginning of second, 76, we got the punk movement. Yes. Therefore that on parole album, which is here. <laughs> This on parole album. Can you see this? Uh, I, I see it. There you go. Oh, okay. That's this, classic. this 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 album, which has just been re well, no more than re-released. It's a new version, gotcha. remastered and all, remastered, and some lots of bonus tracks on it. Nice. Um, with me on almost every track with nice. Filthy. Nice. Um, but we'll come back to that in a bit, if you like. Yes. But there, therefore, this this Motorhead, this beginning of Motorhead due to our obsessions, due to Boris the Spider, due to the Lemmy bass sound, due to this Hawkwind approach, that Hawkwind were such a, they were kind of space rock hippie band. Okay. Right, right. Okay, in Labrock Grove, this seedy place with, with rundown squats and all the rest of it where we all lived. Gotcha. And therefore you've got, and I'm rambling, you, you asked me to ramble, didn't you? Yes. It's, but all, no. it's, all, it's, all, it's, all, it's all Vivek's fault, you see. He, he told me I could ramble. So, 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 so if I'm rambling too much, you can blame him. Hey, I li he I, I, my listeners will enjoy it. Trust me, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying everything you're telling me right now. <laughs> it's Oops, just, oh, you, just, you, just, you just slipped, sorry. That's all good. Just, just no, rolling, my, rolling myself a cigarette. Hang it's, on. All, it's all good. No, you but I'll, yeah. but, yes, I do. But I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this, like, like so so obviously when you met Lemmy you both you, you you like you two had a lot of agreements on just a lot of like you said you guys had so much stuff in common so I assume like when you picked him up from the airport after he was sacked from Hawk when you both like Lemmy was like let's make a band no he wasn't okay mm. not at all not okay. at all no Lemmy was a car crash when I picked him up from the airport he was a complete and utter car crash. Yeah. He was completely effed up. Yeah. Beep. And, uh, and, and he, he was really destroyed. He was so upset. Okay. He couldn't believe that, that, that his band had sacked him. Wow. Bear in mind, Lemmy had everything going for him in Hawkwind. Yes, he did. Because bizarrely, um, he, by accident, he became the star of Hawkwind. Yeah. I mean, completely by accident. Silver Machine was recorded at the Roundhouse where we did our first gig as Motorhead. Yes. They were, out, they were all, including Lemmy, out of their brains on acid. <laughs> when they went into the studio to listen to the recording, they realized that Dave, uh, Bob Calvert, who was, a, who was singing Silver Machine in the live show, yes. they realized it really didn't cut it. So they, they went through, all, every single member of Hawkwind tried to sing it, Silver Machine. Yeah. And finally, begrudg begrudgingly, they came around to Lemmy and said, 
uh, Lemmy, can you have a go, please? And Lemmy goes, well, all right, I'll have a go. Yeah. And, uh, and Lemmy gets up and sings it perfectly. <laughs> so, so he became, this became the biggest hit that Hawkwind ever had. Yep. And so completely by accident, he becomes the star of Hawkwind. Wow. Now, bear in mind that he is living on another planet to Hawkwind. They're all taking acid, smoking dope all he's, day. He's, wow. it's going up like prices at Christmas. And, um, <laughs> And you know that phrase, right? Out of yeah. Motorhead, the song. Yep. And he, he is completely in another land. Um, yep. He's got no responsibility for running a band. <laughs> he's got no responsibility for, for keeping the band going and make, keeping everybody happy in the band, all that stuff. He's got no responsibility for leading the band, but he's kind of the star. Therefore, he comes up and does Silver Machine and he's, all the girls are rallying around. Oh, people yeah. Want to, people want to interview him. Yeah. Therefore, the the other members of the band who were in the in the band way before he was Dave Brock, of, Nick Turner, and all those guys. Yep. A lot of jealousy going down. Wow. Of course, of course. So when he got kicked out, he got kicked out for carrying two grams of amphetamine sulfate rolled up in his sleeve, as he yep. always did. Yep. Um, in his jacket on the Canadian border, which was the worst border in the world for getting busted. Wow. Oh yeah. They, yeah. They've written, you know, the Canadians yeah. are very hard, hard asked about this. Yeah, yes, and, they uh, are. Yes, they, 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 are. Have, they have good, good security. Yes, they do. Ooh. Even to this very day. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The mountains really cut it. Yeah. And, um, and so, so in the bus, and I have this from Doug Smith, who is Hawkins' manager, who became Motorhead's manager, who I'm in touch with all the time at the moment. Gotcha. For, for, for on parole, in fact. And, gotcha. um, and there they are in the bus. So picture this. They're in the bus. And they all turn around to Lemmy, who's sitting at the back of the bus, and say, Lemmy, you're not carrying anything, are you? Oh, no, I'm not carrying anything. It's all right. I'm clean. Sure enough, <laughs> he, gets bu he gets busted. Oh. Now, it's been going on for months and months and months where we were hanging out together, where often they'd call me up, panic, at like four or five in the afternoon. Yeah, where's Lemmy? We haven't seen Lemmy. We can't find him. And of course, Lemmy and I had been up for like two nights or three nights in the road and fi finally he's crashed. He's fallen asleep somewhere. Yeah. And they can't find him to go on tour. So you mix the jealousy, the fact that he lives in, a, in another time zone. Yeah. Um, the jealousy of he's become the star of the band, plus this, this speed thing. Yeah. And finally, we're at the Canadian border and this is the final straw. Yeah. So he gets busted. He gets put in jail. Yeah. And they go off to, to, to continue the tour without him. Yeah. And the next morning, it turns out that amphetamine sulfate is not illegal in, 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 in Canada, only cocaine. They thought it was cocaine. Oh. And they, they, they can't bust him. <laughs> no. Unfortunately for them, they can't bust him. Yeah. So Lemmy comes out and they call up Nick Turner and say, listen, we're on, we're on the way to, to, to the sound check. Yeah. Um, you know, so we'll play the gig. You know, Lemmy will play the gig. Yeah. And so they turn up, do the sound check, play the gig as if everything's normal. He gets into the dressing room and he is sacked. 